And now, without further ado, we turn to Professor Chin, who will teach us some of the wisdom of Confucius, another ancient sage whose wisdom illuminates us to this day. Now, you also have little note cards. If you have questions, please take them down after the lecture. We will uh, bring them forward. We'll take a little break, uh, and then we will have a question and answer. But for now, we would like to hear from Professor Chin. Thank you, Mordechai. Thank you, actually, um, Yeshiva University for having me here. Um, and thank you for coming in this wintry day. It's, um, it's a surprising, isn't it? We're in the middle of fall, and yet it feels like the middle of winter. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I've gotten to know Professor Cohen um, quite well in the last year because of our shared interests in early texts, biblical texts on Professor Cohen's side and um, Confucian and Taoist texts on my side. And we have also been in conversation about what, how we might bring um, the two traditions, Chinese and Jewish, in, together in comparative studies, which we believe will allow um, us to achieve a kind of broader understanding of each of the traditions separately. I understand that this series of lectures in um, Chinese and Jewish conversation is designed specifically with this purpose in mind, and I applaud it. And I hope that the conversations will broaden, will expand, and also will last for a very, very long time. Now, before I plunge into the subject of my lecture today, um, and the title is, Confucius, You Surprised Me, Readings from the Analects on Learning, Governance, and P the Political Life. So before I, I start um, just getting right into this particular subject, I would like first to sketch in some background regarding the historical Confucius and also his relationship to the Analects, the book that is most closely connected with him. Confucius dates, um, Professor Motahai already showed you um, right there on the board. Um, his dates were five, it, it doesn't matter, I have, I'll say it, yeah, from 551 to 479 BCE. He was born into a family that had long ago lost their hereditary status and privileges. But in early China, and not just in Confucius' time, but for many centuries prior to his time, in fact, as early as the 10th century BCE, and this is already being established through the bronze inscriptions, we know that as far back as the 10th century BCE, it was possible for a person with skills in the civil and military arts to prove himself in office and to work himself up the bureaucratic ladder. This was the path that Confucius followed, a series of very modest positions in an aristocratic family, first as keeper of granary and livestock, and then as a district officer in the family's feudal domain led to more important appointments in the government of Confucius' home state of Lu. You can follow all this. I have a, you know, a sheet of, of terms and names. So some of the important ones will be on there. So that very, those very modest positions followed um, uh, uh, he, because he worked very hard at it, so eventually he got much more important appointments in the actual the government of his home state of Lu. And the state of Lu was one of several regional states in the period of Chinese history where there was still a perfunctory king, but this king had no authority over the governments of these regional states and no say at all 
as these regional rulers jostled for power. Confucius' tenure in the government of Lu was cut short by internal politics. And he was forced to leave not only his position, but also his home. So between the years of 498 to 484 BCE, Confucius was on the road, wandering from state to state with only a few disciples at his side in search of a ruler who might be willing to be guided by his vision of a virtuous government. But Confucius had no success. His teachings of family and politics, of human relationships in the larger world, and also of the idea of moral virtue also did not gain much traction. And so one could say that Confucius would have been very surprised if he were alive today to learn that people in the 25 years, uh, 2,500 years since his death had taken such a serious interest in what he said and what he taught in the records of the Analects. And so what is the Analects? The Analects is Confucius' book. He did not write it, but it's his voice we hear as we learn about his life and aspirations, his thoughts about the political practice and the powerful men of his time, what his disciples were like and what he was like as a teacher, things that irritated him and gladdened his heart, his love for music and poetry, and why he believed that the rights of life, R-I-T-E-S, the rights of life, formal or informal, at home or in the village community or in the ruler's court, all these rights, these what I will call rights of life, if they were carried out with a sense of propriety, they could affect an inward change, a moral transformation in a person. And the Analects, the book where we find his voice and bits of records of Confucius' life and thought was probably compiled in the second century BCE. That is, in the first 100 years of the Han Dynasty, and three, more than 300 years after Confucius' death. There were three versions of this book at first, but the book eventually stabilized in the first century BCE into 20 chapters, and it became the version that we have now. And one could see from this version, this what we call the received version, that the compilers refrained from imposing order and coherency on the gathered records, which added tactility to the book. Thus, Confucius was lively. Okay. Thus, Confucius was lively in the Analects as he talked about himself and the world, what he hoped to accomplish, and what he knew that he simply could not accomplish, but still persisted in trying. His comments in the records of the Analects could often be surprising, and sometimes they might even seem contradictory, which is understandable. Okay, that's okay. You couldn't hear in the back? Are you, is it better now? Okay. So as I said, his comments in the Analects could often be surprising, and could often be surprising, and sometimes they could even seem contradictory, which is understandable because he was not responsible for the book that became indistinguishable from him. In my talk today, I would like to focus on the surprising elements in Confucius' comments, specifically on what he said regarding government and the political life. But why did I choose government and politics? Well, because what Confucius said on these subjects, on politics and governance, 
reflects the eternal veritas of their complicated relationship, which has... Sorry? Okay, shall I do that? Whoa, that really resounds in my ears. So, okay, I'll repeat that. Why government and politics? Why did I want to find the surprising elements? <laughs> okay, we'll get through this. Is that good? Okay. So, why government and politics? Why am I interested in finding the surprises in what he said about government and politics? Um, because I feel that what he said on these two subjects reflects reflects the eternal veritas of their complicated relationship, which has particular significance for us when our own country is, is in the midst of a political crisis. So I myself, I've been reading, thinking, teaching, and writing about Confucius for most of my adult life. So how is it possible that his words at times could still be a surprise to me? Just what sort of surprise am I referring to? And why is it that a remark that strikes me now is particularly sharp or perceptive did not have the same effect on me a few years ago? One could say that this is the mystery of reading, that some thought some idea could still seem so fresh, so forceful, all of a sudden, when you, when you least expected it. One could say also that this is the power of great literature. The 18th century scholar Cheng Yaotian said this about literature. In an essay called Informal Notes on Learning, and Mr. Chung writes, its influence can be more inspiring than being in the presence of a great man because it calls upon us to articulate our ideas and it beckons us to draw analogies. So what literature offers is more than just something to rely on. It takes us by the hand and boister, boisters up us up. It holds us by the arm and gets us on our way. And this is how I feel about the Analects, the Lun Yu. In my talk today, I'm going to focus on just three chapters from this book, chapters 12, 13, and 14, to see how they can call upon us to articulate our own ideas and beckons us to draw analogies. But first, I want to say something about my own experience with the Analects from a few years back when I tried to give the Analects a new translation with annotations. What it was like to wrestle with this text together with heaps of glosses and commentaries written over the last 2,000 years. I've always had great respect for the Chinese commentary tradition and have always thought that it defines the Chinese intellectual tradition. And my own love for texts, especially the early texts, has always been fueled by the commentaries. When I was working on my earlier book, The Authentic Confucius, it was the commentaries that guided me, helping me to find the historical Confucius. But to attempt a new translation of the Analects meant that I had to understand every passage, every sentence, every word in this text. And as a result, I get, became very dependent on the commentary tradition to get me on the right track, to help me piece together historical circumstances and give each name mentioned in the text an identity. Reading the commentaries in large bulk is hard work, but knowledge, 
but the knowledge and the surprises they yield is worth the effort. I'll give you an example, and this is from the last entry in book 14. So it's entry 44 in book 14. I think it's on your handouts if you want to check. I'm pretty sure it is. Yes. <coughs> A young boy from Chue took on the task as a messenger for the people of this district. Someone asked Confucius, do you see him as someone who is eager to make progress in his learning? Yi zhe yu. The master replied, I've seen this boy sitting down in the gathering of adults and walking abreast of his elders. He's not someone who seeks to make progress. He simply wants to grow up fast. The two words, yi and cheng, are critical to our reading of this exchange about the boy because Confucius said that the boy is not after yi, not after learning, but he, or progress in learning, but he's after cheng, he wants to grow up fast. It was a 19th century scholar, Liu Banan, in his collected commentary on the Analects, where he explained yi to mean to make progress in learning and cheng to mean to grow up fast. He found support for his reading in the glosses of two Han Dynasty um, uh, uh, scholars. And the Confucius, you surprise me moment for me is this, just how closely Confucius observed a person, even a boy's movement and conduct in his attempt to evaluate the person's character. Here Confucius noticed the boy sitting down in the gathering of adults and walking abreast of his elders, which a child under, under the age of 16 was not entitled to. So surely, he said, this child was someone who could not wait to grow up, but someone who was eager, uh, not someone who was eager to learn. How fresh this observation, I thought, and how closely it resonates with our feelings about the young. We also learn from this passage that the boy was from the district of Chue. Again, the commentaries tell us that Chue was Confucius' home district. Thus, Confucius was looking at a boy from a close distance. This was first-hand knowledge. This record, however, does not at all suggest that Confucius had any pre preconsumptions about the young, because he also said in Book 9, Passage 3, the young should have our respect. How do we know that the coming generation may not prove to be the equal of the present one? That's nice, isn't it? This is just one very small example where Confucius surprised me. But there are other instances where the surprise has deeper moral ramifications, as in Book 14, Passage 34, where someone asked Confucius what he thought of the expression, repay a wrong with kindness. And this is Confucius' response. I'm sorry, I don't think that's in the, <laughs> in the handouts. So someone asked Confucius, what do you think of the expression, repay wrong with kindness? And Confucius' response was like this. Now how then would you repay kindness? You should repay wrong, a wrong with uprightness. Repay kindness with kindness. And again, I like this particular um, 19th century scholar's gloss on this, on what Confucius said. And this scholar writes, a person who deals a wrong with uprightness simply does not want to put his grievance under covers. It is human nature to rejoice in seeing justice being done. In the case of a grievance, one hopes to forget it. In the case of kindness, one hopes never to forget it. Thus, he who repays a wrong with uprightness does so with a wish that would be, there would be no trace of grievance left in his mind. 
and those who repay kindness with kindness does so with a wish that the kindness of others will never disappear from his mind. The mind cannot forget a grievance, but one can use an open and upright response to overcome that feeling. The opposite of openness and uprightness is pretense, to teach people to respond to a wrong with kindness to, is to teach them to engage in pretense. So this is what this scholar from the 19th century said. And so this is another kind of surprise that Confucius could spring on us, ones that force us to reflect more honestly about a moral question and stop us from engaging in pretense. Yet even bigger surprises are stored uh, in store for us in books 12, 13, 14 of the Analects. They are found in Confucius' comments regarding politics and the political life. But to have a grasp of what Confucius said in these chapters, one would need to find a thread to string together the ideas discussed therein. And to find that thread, I will start with Confucius' cover egg comments on governance, on the principle of governance, and the difficulty of realizing it, on what he thinks is the first thing one should do if this person is being put in charge of a district or a state, on what he considers as an ordered society, and whether capital punishment has a part in helping a state to maintain order. Closely related to the question of governance is the question of who are fit to govern, what sort of men are best suited for the political office and the hurly-burly of politics, what sort of skills and character should these men possess, and what examples from the past should they emulate. Confucius, in his teachings, stressed the importance of rights, music, and poetry in personal cultivation in the cultivation of our humanity. But how do these skills, these arts, fit into Confucius' political thought? Did he regard them as aid to government? In considering these questions, let's begin with what he said on the subject of government. Most of his comments in this regard appear in his conversations with four uh, disciples, Dizi, from the older generation, and there are Zi Lu, Zi Gong, Zhong Gong, and Ran Qiu. And then also in his conversation with a person from the younger generation of disciples, and his name is Zi Zhang. As for the principle of government, Confucius most sustained deliberations on this subject appeared in Book 13, Passage 3, in his conversation with his <coughs> disciple Zilu, when Zilu asked him if the ruler of Wei were to wait for, for you to take charge of his government, what would you do first? In response, Confucius said, rectifying names in Chinese is Zhengming. So what is Zhengming? Rectifying names. It means that a father will have to live up to the responsibility of a father. He cannot just be a father in name. And the same applies to the son, and the same applies to the <coughs> ruler and his minister. They all have to live up to the responsibility of that name, whether it's a father, a son, a ruler, or a minister. But if, he said, he went on to say, so the first thing to do is rectifying names. Because if names are not rectified, what is said does not seem reasonable. And what's said does not seem reasonable. Nothing will get accomplished. When nothing gets accomplished, Rights, R-I-T-S, 
and music will not flourish. And when rights and music do not flourish, punishment and penalties will take their place and they will fail to be just when put into use. And when punishments and penalties fail to be just in practice, people will not know where to put their hands and feet. Thus, by explaining why he would rectify names first, if he were put in charge of a state, Confucius sketched out a theoretical framework for government, and not any government, but one that had a moral end, and one that relied on the flourish of rights and music, and not on the arbitrary rules and the threats of punishment to ensure order and security. But when it comes to specific questions of how to govern, Confucius offered a different kind of advice. After his disciple Zhong Gong was appointed a steward in this in an aristocratic family, he asked in um, Book 13, Passage 2, about the way of governing. And Confucius said, the first thing to do is to assemble your staff and to assign them to the right positions. Try to overlook their minor shortcomings. Promote those of outstanding talent. And then his disciple Zhong Gong said, how can I recognize those of outstanding talent in order to promote them? And Confucius said, promote those that you recognize to be outstanding. As for those that you missed, will other people let them slip by you? So the surprise here is that Confucius said to his disciple that after assigning those in your staff to their right positions, he said, try to overlook their minor shortcomings. And when Zhong Gong asked, how, could I, how do I recognize men of talent in order to promote them? He said, well, promote those you know to be talented. As for the rest of them, don't worry. Others will inform you about these, more, these other talented men, as long as you are willing to listen. And when his disciple Zi Lu asked about the way of government, Confucius simply said, take the lead then put, and then put people to work. Do not let up your effort. Confucius was plain spoken and direct in these two passages from book 13, 13, 1 and 2. But things get more interesting in 13, 9, in a conversation that he had with another disciple while the two were in the state of way. As I mentioned at the very beginning, that he, in fact, was, um, he spent 14 years in self-exile, traveling from various regional states in search of a government job. It was the, a misstep um, that happened in his own political career that, in fact, uh, resulted in his expulsion from his home state of Lu. And the state of Wei was a place that he stayed the longest during his travels. So as he entered the state of Wei, Confucius noticed that this state had a huge population, which usually meant that either the ruler or his counselors were doing something right to have attracted so many people to move there. And so his disciple Ran Qiu, who was driving the carriage, asked Confucius, when you already have a lot of people, what else should you do? And Confucius replied, make them rich. And once they are rich, what comes next, his disciples said. Then instruct them. Scholars like, you know, they get really sort of a special Confucius scholars. They're just not quite sure how to interpret that. It didn't seem like what a moral philosopher like Confucius would have said, that make the people rich first before you instruct them. And so, <coughs> excuse me. And they will use sort of <coughs> a 
other later Confucius thinkers is a way to explain this. <coughs> And they like to use another very important Confucian thinker called Mencius <clears throat> to explain this. And they said what Confucius meant is it's important for the state, for the government, <clears throat> to institute for the people a means of support so that elderly and children will have you know, means to be taken care of. But I, I still like what he said, the key to the way it is, make the people rich. The latter is much more flexible and more open. This idea is more open to interpretations to how to make the people rich. Counselors of later time, especially toward the end of the Han, um, of, I would say the middle of the Han Dynasty, and also um, in the 11th century, the reformers from, <clears throat> reformers from the Song Dynasty, they were pushed for riskier, and more ambitious, and more imaginative plans to make the people rich, while their opponents will object to these policy on the grounds that these reformers allow the idea of profit to be acceptable in government practice. So I, I think, again, to keep that open, to say that Confucius indeed said, make the people rich first before you instruct them is much more interesting, I think. <clears throat> now, what else did Confucius say about you know, ways of being a good ruler? Other than make them rich and then instruct them. Confucius felt that rulers should give his people seven years of instruction before he's ready to arm them for military service. And if a ruler sends his troops to war without instructing them, this is the same, he said, is throwing them away. These two statements have particular resonance for us, I think, for us who have also known our own wars, unpreparedness or lack of instruction has uh, contributed not only to casualties in war, injuries in war, but also emotional and psychological damages, either during deployment or after the soldiers have come home. I think we know quite a lot about that. And on the subject of capital punishment, when Confucius was asked in Book 12, Passage 19, whether in order to realize the moral way, you'll be all right to kill those who do not live by it. And Confucius' reply was like this, why would you need to kill anyone to bring about a moral order? The character of those at the top is like that of the wind. The character of those below is like that of grass. When wind blows on the grass, the grass is sure to bend. This last statement, may sound simple and natural. And, but this is not what Confucius, you know, this is not what he, all he has to say on this. Because he also said in um, book 13, passage 11, only after good men have been in government for 100 years is there the possibility of winning the war against cruelty and doing away with capital punishment. And what if, there were a true king, what happens then? He actually says, it would still have to take a whole generation before humaneness could prevail. And what if Confucius himself were put in charge of government? He said it would take him a year to bring things to an acceptable, acceptable condition, and then another three years for him to have real accomplishments to show. From these comments, it seems that Confucius had only modest expectations what, of what he could attain if he were put in charge of, a, of the government of a state, and also very modest expectation even of the doings of a good man, a decent man, even of a true king. 
And Confucius made no secret about the utter frustration he experienced in his attempt to serve government. And this is why it's so poignant to hear his response to the recluses who tried to persuade him, to entice him to come and join them in the mountains or in the wilds where there was no one to serve. One such instance happened what appeared in book 14, passage 39. I think that's in your um, handouts. When Confucius were pl was playing, in this, playing the stone chimes in the state of Wei, and a man carrying a bamboo basket, that is to say, usually a man carrying a bamboo basket is an indication that this is a recluse. So when he went past Confucius' door, he heard Confucius playing the stone chimes. I don't know anybody seeing stone chimes in the, any of the Chinese uh, museums. Have you ever seen it? Beautiful stone chimes hanging there. And when you strike it, it has a deep, deep sound. It's a most beautiful kind of musical instrument. And so here's this recluse, heard Confucius playing the stone chimes as this recluse was going past by Confucius' door. And this man, this recluse said, this playing is fraught with a heavy and careworn heart. How squalid this kung kung sound. This is what playing the stone chime sounds like, this kung kung sound. If no one understands him, then he should just keep what he believes to himself, and that's all. If the water is deep, just wade across it. If the water is shallow, lift your hem and cross it. And when Confucius heard the, what the recluse said, he responded this way. He said, this man sounds like he knows what he wants. If he's so resolute, he should not have any, have any difficulties. I think what Confucius meant here is this that this bamboo basket carrier, that this recluse must be someone who is resolute. So he adjusts the length of his garment to the depth of water, to let himself steep in the world when virtue is high and plenty. And he will lift himself up when virtue is shallow and scarce. And Confucius res respects his decision but also thinks that if this man is so clear-eyed about what to do and how to act, he should have no difficulties at all, which is, un which is unlike him who believed that a truly, a true gentleman, a virtuous man, should get himself involved in the world. Such a man should take um, take up government service in order to understand the moral responsibilities between a ruler and his subject. Even though such a man knows all along that it's impossible to put the moral way into practice. What significance this has for us the day before Bill Taylor and George Kent testify before the House on the Impeachment Inquiry. I think a lot about Confucius when I um, uh, sort of follow the impeachment um, inquiry. So it's with this knowledge, it's impossible to put the moral way into practice that Confucius offers his advice to his young men, to those young men who aspire to become government officials. He tells them in, books, in book 14, <coughs> passages 1, 2, and 3, when it's appropriate to serve, and when it's appropriate to accept a salary, and when it's appropriate not to accept a salary, and when an official should be exacting action in words, and when an official should be exact in action but soft in words. 
and that if a person sets his mind in becoming an official, he has to be able to resist the urge to go home. In other words, while he is in office, he should not long for the ease he'll find at home. And these are just some of the practical advice he offered to the educated professional or those who are aspire to become um, an educated professional about how to perform duties in government with integrity. Confucius also spoke on a deeper level about the moral requisites of a, an educated professional, a shi, about the proper conduct of a humane man and about the importance of having keen perception and unclouded judgment. I particularly like what he said in um, <coughs> Book 12, Passage 2. He tells his disciple, Zhong Gong, who has just been appointed a position in government. He tells him, when abroad, when you're not in your home state, conduct yourself as if you are receiving an honored guest. When employing the service of your people in your state, deport yourself as if you have been put in charge of a grand sacrifice. Do not impose on <laughs> others what you do not desire for yourself. I was particularly moved by what he said when he said, uh, by what he said regarding employing the service of your people in your state. When you do that, deport yourself as if you have been put in charge of a grand sacrifice. It is with that religious kind of um, uh, um, attitude, with that sort of respect that you should employ the service of the people in your state. And this description of what Confucius consider is a proper ritual conduct in the political world, I feel is correct because in the, its operating principle is do not impose on others what you do not desire yourself, which of course is an expression of ren, of humaneness. Elsewhere in the Analects, Confucius also talked about the moral efficacy of poetry and music. So while the rites, ritual practice, is to steady us, music is to give our spirit an exhortation, and mu I'm sorry, that is poetry, is to give um, our spirit an exhortation, and music is the final lesson, because music is able to bring together all the different voices in harmony. And he also emphasized the importance of putting the knowledge of poetry and music to use in political functions. He said a person may be able to recite the 300 poems, but if he's unable to put this knowledge to full use when he's given a political assignment, if he's unable to hold his own in, in a diplomatic exchange when he's sent abroad, on the mission, no matter how many poems he's learned, what good will that do? Confucius, in these three chapters, he also said, had a lot more to say about perception and judgment and moral acumen. And since our time is, I'm getting close to our time, right? So I will skip quite a lot of it. And just to mention to one thing about keen perception, which I really like. He was telling uh, one of his younger disciples when he asked, this disciple asked, what is keen perception? And he said, when slanders that seep under your skin and grievances that cut through your flesh do not drive you to a, an immediate response, you may be said to have keen perception. Now this particular disciple is considered one of the smartest, but he was also a terribly arrogant young man. And so I, I think in this disciple's mind when he asked that question, he was expecting his teacher to begin with something, to tell him with something grand, something that he alone could grasp. And yet 
Confucius surprised him. His description of keen perception was tactile, beginning with slanders and grievances that gnaw you and pain you if they do not drive you to an immediate response, Confucius said. Then, only then, you could be said to have keen perception. Now, did Confucius feel anyone amongst his contemporaries could be considered as fit for government, or those who are already in office could be considered as um, capable in um, exercising their responsibilities? And the answer is Confucius was quite sure that there was no one who was fit for office during his time, and no one who was in office could be considered a true gentleman. And so one of his disciples asked him, what sort of man could be considered as good enough to be in government? He's a man with a sense of shame, with a sense of self-awareness, and who will not bring disgrace to the mission their ruler has entrusted them. And what would come next, his disciples said, were those who are good sons in the eyes of their kin and, and fine young men in the eyes of their neighbors and villagers. And the level below that, Confucius said, men who insist on keeping their words and seeing their actions to the end, they have little pebbles for brains and are inferior indeed. But I suppose you can say they, they come next. And what about those who are in public life now? And Confucius' answer is, huh? They are puny vessels, men with hardly any capacity. They don't even count. And so if that's the case, then what sort of examples that he himself would like to emulate, will ask his disciples to emulate. I'll just mention one example, and these are examples from the past. And this person, his name is Guan Zhong, and he's from, he was from the seventh century BCE. His Confucius evaluation of this man surprised his disciples, because this man, he decided not to commit suicide when his lord, was murdered by another powerful man, another powerful ruler. And this man, Guan Zhong, not only did not commit suicide when other attendants committed suicide, but he decided to serve the man who was responsible for the murder of his lord. And so his disciples said, Guan Zhong was simply inhumane. And Confucius said, that is not so. Confucius said, I consider him humane, a humane man, because this man, Guan Zhong, served as the counselor of Duke Huan. Duke Huan was the person who was responsible for the murder of his lord, of Guan Zhong's lord. He saw to it that this ruler, Duke Huan, was able to stand as the lord protector among yeah the regional rulers drawing all the states together under one empire. In fact, it was due to this man's tact and skills that Duke Huan was able to unite the empire without flexing, flexing his muscles. And so Confucius concluded, how could Guan Zhong have acted on the petty loyal of a common man or a common woman and committed suicide in the ditch without anyone taking notice. And so here we see the kind of flexibility that he has in his judgment of a counselor. And <clears throat> so from all this, it seems that Confucius is, as a moral arbiter, allow himself to overlook certain irregularities in the man's conduct. If this man possesses the kind of political know-how and political intuition and vision that would get him to achieve greater things. So greater things for Confucius nearly always meant greater benefits for the public. It's for the good of the public that Confucius felt a person should get involved in politics. Because only then he would have a chance to test himself to see if he had the moral strength 
and the moral color, uh, courage to take a government to a moral end. So this is what we learn, right? And yet, and yet, so we feel, so we already sort of could see that Confucius some someone who feels that the good for the, the greater good, for the public, is what one should aim for, is what is most important. And that greater good is, in Chinese, is gong or public good. And that should be the goal of any government. If that is the case, then why did he judge this man called upright gong so severely in book 13, passage 18? Now, upright gong, he actually bore witness against his father who had stolen a sheep. And so he brought this before, before the, the public officer. And so his conduct should have been a model of doing good for the public. But Confucius thought otherwise. He said, where I came from, those who were considered upright are different from this man, upright gong. He said, from where I came from, fathers cover up for their sons and sons cover up for their fathers. Uprightness lies therein. Many scholars and thinkers since Confucius' time understood Confucius to say that fathers and sons and sons should cover up for one another. The uprightness is found in such behavior. But how could this be, one should ask. If this is what Confucius meant by uprightness lies therein, was he not advocating the importance of protecting one's private interests, in this case, the interests of one's family, at the expense of the greater good? Did he not contradict himself? Again, I'm coming back to this 18th century scholar called Chen Yaotian, whose name I mentioned at the very beginning because of what he said about the power of literature. So Chen Yaotian had a wonderful gloss on this. He said that Confucius, <clears throat> he's, uh, this is what he said, um, he said that if this reading that Confucius actually felt that the family should come before the state, then the tussle between these two opposing loyalties could never be conceived is a moral problem because the person faced with this question will always stand on the side of the family. So there's no moral tussle to speak of. So Mr. Chung refer to understand I prefer to understand Confucius in the light of Confucius' strength as a moral thinker. Thus he regarded, uh, he argued in saying that in these four characters, zhi zai qi zhong, uprightness lies therein, means that Co Confucius is saying to us that we should use the fullness of our private affections to realize what is good for the public. And that's a much difficult task. You have to use the fullness of, so fathers should cover up for the fa son, and son should cover up for the uh, father. It's in that, it's like that's the private affections, right? You cannot escape that, it's just there for you, it's natural. It's therein you find what is right. So a brightness should be found while you're going through this moral tussle. And I'm absolutely for Mr. Chung's reading, because I too like to understand Confucius in light of his strength as a moral thinker. And what's more, I like the fact that he's always ready to spring a surprise on us. When we think that we finally understood him, when we think that we have finally got him. Thank you. Do we have five minutes, right? Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Chin. Uh, what we will do at this point is uh, 
break for a few minutes. Uh, and uh, we have these uh, cards. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please write down your question and bring it up to the front. Uh, and we'll, uh, Professor Chin will have a look at the questions. Uh, if someone needs to leave at this point, it might be a good uh, breaking time. And let's reconvene in five minutes. Xi Jinping, I think, took a much more uh, serious interest. And so he visited, for instance, Confucius' uh, hometown in Chifu and made several, actually several speeches in regard to regarding his reading of the Analex, which is quite interesting. And again, he wants to have a kind of harmonious existence of traditional Confucian thought with Marx's um, uh, uh, Mao thought. And uh, he never, I don't think he, he was serious enough to re resolve the contradictions between the two. And the other question is very similar. And is there another one? Anybody else has a question? It was about the first presentation by Ezra. Oh, okay. So. You got Anybody else with any questions you want to ask? I just want to mention, too, if you're interested, I mean, um, I was mentioning to one of you out there that um, in terms of formation of the NLX, I mean, it's, um, it's a very controversial question. I mean, Scholars debated over 2,000 years about, you know, whether the text originally came from the records of Confucius' own disciples. I don't think it happened that way, but there's a very important sort of just a fragment of a record in the Analex where we learn that his disciple Zixia jotted down something that Confucius said on his sash. So there must be some records. I and mean, this was in the Analex. Just people just, it was there. So it was ju not just from the oral tradition. There was something done. Maybe it was um, something one could say that, um, that um, uh, it was disciples, disciples, you know, it was probably passed down orally and with some written records and so on. So I just want to mention two excavations that happened in China, one in the, in the 1970s, and another one just recently, about four years ago. Um, and both are so important, because we, from these excavations, we found two, two actually material um, texts of the Analex, and both were dated before the Analex stabilized to become what we have now is the received text. And so, um, both are pretty much very corrupt. I mean, they're they're just real fragments. And the second one that was discovered, it was discovered, as I said, about four years ago, and scholars are still studying. It's maybe one of the three texts I mentioned. Is it one of the three? You know, there's the the Qi Confucius uh, and Analex, the Lu, and then there is the the ancient text. And so it's w maybe one of the three that was discovered most recently, but it's just, it, it, most of it's just uh, disappeared. But there are some, there is a, because the received text has 20 chapters, and this one has 22. And so we think it's a Qi version. Just want to mention that. Thank you.